Hey, before we get started this week, I just wanted to give everyone a quick update on BJJ Mental Models Premium. I think at this point we've got over 32 hours of educational jujitsu material on there. We just launched a new seven-part premium series with Rob Bernacki, another six-part premium series with Preet Mikkelsen, so a lot of good reasons to check out Premium if you haven't already. Please do take a second and do me a favor, check it out, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. There is a free trial, so you can check it out at no cost. Again, if you haven't looked already, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 177. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, pleased to be joined by Mr. Seth Smith. Seth, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I am also doing good. Happy to be connected with you here. Going to talk about some arm triangles today, which I'm excited to do. We've uh, had some other episodes recently on other variants of head and arm chokes like Darces and Anacondas. So arm triangles are actually one of my favorite submissions in theory, but I personally suck at them. So I'm hoping that you can help all of us, myself included, get better here. But maybe before we do that, why don't you give yourself a quick intro? Just tell everyone who you are, where you're from, how long you've been training and all of that. Okay. Well, my name's Seth Smith, and uh, I've been training since 2001, and I'm a black belt under Ryan Hall, and I have an academy in Richmond, Virginia called Upstream BJJ. Nice, nice. And we got a few mutual friends, which is how we got connected here and you came onto my radar. And like I said, I was told that, hey, if you got arm triangle questions, Seth is the guy. So what I'd love to do today is just run through, do a kind of a deep dive and a breakdown into this lovely technique that a lot of people kind of struggle with. I mean, I remember when I was training as a white belt and a blue belt, for a long time, I had it in my head that arm triangles were a big guy choke. Because you, uh-huh. you, famously, when you think of arm triangles being done, you think of like Brock Lesnar doing them on Shane Carwin, stuff like uh-huh. that, right? And yeah. there's no question that it's going to be easier if you're huge, but most submissions work like that. But arm triangles are something I've kind of come to understand as I, I get more experienced in the art. They are doable for a smaller person. And even if you're not able to finish with the squeeze, they're still worth practicing just as a pin and a hold and a transition, if nothing else. So with that said, I was thinking that maybe today we could talk arm triangle strategy and I could maybe ask you about some of the common do's and don'ts about the submission and hopefully we can help turbocharge everyone's game out there. Okay. All right. So first thing I'd love to dig into here when we're talking about this technique, the common thing, like I said earlier, is there is a perception that arm triangles are a big guy submission. And I think that that's been kind of proven not to be completely the case because I know a lot of smaller people who just are wicked with these things. But tell me about your thoughts on this. When we talk about these arm triangles, how do you feel when you're pulling them off against a bigger person versus a smaller person? Are there any things that need to be considered, especially if you're trying to do an arm triangle against someone who's just a giant? Well, I think inherently you're always going to have more to deal with when you're doing an arm triangle versus like having a choke that's just directly on the neck, like a rear naked choke, because you have an arm in the lock that you're trying to create. So, you know, that's going to be a bigger thing to hold on to, and it's going to give you more resistance. I think there is, you know, like a size where like, you know, it's not the most effective choice, but as you mentioned earlier, like transitionally, I think it can still be useful. And I think that you know, that you can use it to transition or pin the person down. But yeah, I think that, you know, if I'm really dealing with a giant human being, I'm probably going to be trying to get just the neck and whatever choke I get, whether it be a guillotine or a rear naked choke. But up to a certain, I mean, you know, beyond them just being ridiculously huge, I think that, you know, I can do them on people in the 200 pound range, no problem. I'm not a big guy. I'm like, I'm like 165, it's 170 pounds. So, you know, I'm not a huge person. So how do you do that then? Do you find when you're, you know, when you're grabbing on an arm triangle against someone who's just absolutely massive, you got this thing locked up. The problem I also, I often find against a huge person is 
I can reach around and get the grip. Sure. And and actually, I find against bigger people, sometimes it can be easier to hold that katagatame position just because they're bigger. You know, once you do latch onto their arm and their head, it's harder for them to pull it out. But the challenge that I do find is it's just hard to get the killer squeeze to finish. Um, and just because, you know, if they've got big shoulders, they've got big traps, I just find it very, very hard to squeeze that in. Uh-huh. But I'm guessing I'm probably just not squeezing optimally. I'd love to know when you when it comes to the finishing mechanics of this thing. So you've got the arm trying angle locked in. What do you do to actually close the deal on this thing and get the tap? I'm assuming that you do more than just squeeze like crazy, but I know that everyone has different preferred ways of finishing this guy. So if I'm doing an arm triangle, I don't do anything different against a bigger person or a smaller person. It's different adjustments, but the kind of theory and process is the same. Okay. So what I was saying before is like, You know, like the way I visualize all blood chokes, it's like you're making a triangle around the person's neck. And if you put a triangle like a a pool rack around someone's neck, you would want to have uh, a flat side going across the shoulders. And then you would want the V to line up with the person's throat so that like the V is like right in front. And that's going to make contact with the sides of the person's neck, like the where the carotids are. Okay. So like when I make a triangle around someone's neck, the difference between the arm triangle being a neck crank or an actual choke is really based on the shape and configuration you make around the person's neck so that like if you have your forearm running along their back so that it's running along their shoulders then your bicep is going to be like one part of the v and your chest is going to be the other part of the v and if you make that line up properly you're going to get a good blood choke but If your elbow comes off the floor when you're doing the choke, that one that's reaching around their head, uh, then you're going to be pulling your wrist bone into the back of the person's neck. And that's where it's going to be a neck crank. So people are like, oh, it was cranky or it was like a choke. It's like, that's the difference. It's like, are you pulling your wrist bone into their, you know, the back of their neck or are you using your bicep and, and, you know, humerus and your chest to make that V around their neck and squishing their shoulder into their throat properly? So. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. This is a an interesting point that you bring up here about that pressure triangle when you're finishing a choke. I've I love that idea of kind of making sure that you've got uh, pressure against both carotids and then pressure on the back of the neck. And to your point earlier, when you're talking about a neck only submission, like a guillotine or a rear naked, you can kind of, to some extent, get away with being suboptimal just because if you, I mean, if you, if you have enough squeeze and enough pressure there, yeah. you can still get the tap most likely. But when the arm is involved and you're squeezing someone's head and their arm, it's a lot harder to just power through the submission. So you have less room for error and you really need to, focus on all three sides of the triangle if you want to finish from there. And really, like most importantly, I think you need to think about the two sides of the triangle closing together so that like you have equal pull against the arm that's wrapped around the neck matched with pressure inward from your chest. And those two pressures need to go into each other and not shoot past each other. So if like while you're doing it, you have your body driving towards the head, you're going to be applying pressure in different directions. You want those two pressures of like you driving into them and you pulling your arm into the other side of their neck to meet in the middle. And that's where their neck gets squished. And you can use your chest to make their shoulder like squish into their neck. So that's a really great point here that I think is worth expanding on because I earlier in this conversation, I talked about the squeeze for the arm triangle, but honestly, that's probably a bit of a misnomer because it's a mistake to try to finish the arm triangle with just squeezing power alone. I mean, unless you just have the world's biggest arms, probably you need to do more than just squeeze. It's a lot more about body mechanics and the way you position yourself. So when you've got someone in an arm triangle, what do you do here to make sure that you are applying the force against their neck and the carotids at the correct angles? Presumably you don't just squeeze here, but you know, I've heard different strategies. I've heard some people say they try to drive their weight forward. I've heard people say they try to drive their weight on top top of their opponent, just wondering how you configure your own body in order to maximize the pressure against your opponent's neck. I just get my body into position and then I just have, like I said, I only focus on those two pressures, like me pulling my arm into my body and my body driving into my arm and you got to be in the middle. And I just basically like anchor my 
you know, elbows into my core and I just keep you there and you're in my crock pot and you just got to mm-hmm. cook. And it's not like I'm going to just keep squeezing, like with my pressure kind of going up and down. I, I want to make it kind of crescendo. Like I, I start and I anchor my elbows into my body and I lean into it and I wait. And then if you tap, great. If you don't, I squeeze a little harder and I just keep ramping up until I get you. And then if like, you know, it's just going, you know, way too long and you're not tapping, then I'll use it to transition to something else. But yeah, I don't know. I think it's easier to to show, but than to explain, but you know, like I don't drive towards the head because I think that that's wrong. I, I really just like kind of angle my chest in the right place and I just anchor everything to my body and I, I basically just lay there. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about pinning and bringing your elbows in, which is an interesting detail. I don't hear a lot of people talk about when they're talking about finishing the arm triangle here. Are you trying to do the same thing with your arm and your elbow that's wrapped around your opponent's head? Are you trying to pinch that elbow in too, or just the elbow of yours that's free? If I'm on your left side and I'm wrapping around your neck with my left arm, that arm is going to be palm down. The other one's going to be palm up. I pull my elbows into my core so my right elbow would be anchored into my ribs and I basically kind of lay on my arms and I just keep it into my body. Interesting. So you're kind of, you're almost like posting on your arms in in a way it sounds like. I'm not up on them though. They're Mm -hmm. like pulled in and I'm completely flat. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, but they're, they're weight supporting. Okay. Interesting. And I'm not, I I don't stay up on my knees either. Like I'll pull my heels Mm -hmm. to my butt and like lay there flat and I'll keep Mm -hmm. my knee up on their hip, but I'm basically surfing on my belly. I, I don't stay on my knees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That That's a good idea too, which is something that I like the arm triangle a lot for. And that is as a transition to knee on belly and to mount. I play Kesagatame a lot and I know a lot of people don't like it because they're scared of getting the back taken. But what I find is that Kesagatame plays really well into arm triangles because if you can get your opponent's arm up, then you can usually flip it over and go from Kesagatame into an arm triangle or vice versa. And the benefit to having their arm that exposed is it clears the way to their belly. So like you said, if you if, if you think you have kind of a rough arm triangle position, but you're just not able to finish it for some reason, it's still a super powerful way to open up your opponent's belly so that you can pop right up to a neon belly and get the points for that. And then if you hold the arm triangle, I find actually it's it's easy to transition directly into mount from there. So sure. I find that personally is a very good option if I am going for the arm triangle and I'm just not able to get the finishing squeeze. I'll accept that. And rather than just burning my arms out and stalling, I'll use use that as an opportunity to move into a better point scoring position like the knee ride or ultimately going to mount. And that's kind of, I think, an underutilized aspect of that submission is using it for positional advancement. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think like it comes down to like every submission should have a control element in it. So like if I have you in a triangle, I can choke you with a triangle, but through the triangle, I should be able to control you. If I have you in an arm bar, I can submit you with the arm bar, but I also should be able to like hold you down and limit your options. And so same with the arm triangle. And I think the arm triangle grip is really useful for passing half guard. Like if you can establish it while you're in half guard and you can pin their shoulders with it, then you're most likely going to pass and then you're going to find your way to that choke. I agree 100%. And interestingly, I don't think I've ever seen an instructor teach this, but this is one of my preferred ways to pass the guard. When I'm in half guard on someone, the thing that the person on bottom, that the guard player often expects you to do is to try to cross face them and get a far underhook and try to flatten them, right? Very, very common strategy for passing half guard is you go for the cross face, you pin their shoulders, and then you complete the pass. But you can actually switch your grip around and instead of going for that cross face, you can go for an arm triangle grip from there and pass really effectively. I do this a lot against people if they're just being really stubborn in half guard and I need to move my body a bit offside of theirs. If their arm, their near side arm comes up off the ground and I can get into that arm triangle position, it is a super powerful passing position and it's really hard for your opponent to get your back from there. It's quite safe to do. So this is actually one of my preferred ways 
ways of guard passing now is rather than trying to cross face the guy when I'm in their half guard, I will go for an arm triangle. And even if I can't finish, I will use it as a passing mechanism. Uh huh. Yeah. I use it for half guard passing all the time. I, I try to get that. And that's also like sometimes I tell my students to be real careful about going for Kimuras from the bottom of half guard. Yes. Because you have to open, you have to open your elbow to kind of let their shoulder into your armpit to be able to get the Kimura. But then like, if you have to like, you know, you abandon ship on the Kimura at that point, like it can be dangerous because then they could be into an arm triangle. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to being the person on the bottom and going for a half guard Kimura, I'm personally not a, I mean, granted that's a, a very classic technique, but I'm personally not a big fan of that because First of all, like you said, that's only really going to work if the guy on top makes a big mistake and leaves their elbow open yeah, so that you can reach up and grab the Kimura. And I find that's not really practical against guys who are good. But the other thing is, if you're half guard on the bottom and you go for that Kimura, you're kind of pulling the person's weight on top of you. And I find that's suboptimal because like you said, it can open you up as the guard player to some nasty pinning predicaments like getting stuck in an arm triangle. So it, it is a little bit dicey. But yeah, I would suggest just general feedback to people out there. I mean, if you haven't already considered it, if you are trying to pass someone's half guard and you see the opportunity to take that that katagatame shoulder pin arm triangle position on them, you should totally do that. Because the benefit too is if you use that as a passing mechanism, so you get the arm triangle and then you go to pass, when you pass right into an arm triangle, first of all, you've passed right into a sub, but even if you can't finish, you've cleared the way to neon belly and you've cleared the way to mount. So your worst case scenario is, okay, I wasn't able to finish the arm triangle, but you can still start racking up points really quick because you can go right from the pass, right into neon belly and probably right through to mount. So it's yeah. a really, really powerful passing mechanic. Whereas if you pass half guard in a more traditional way by going for a cross face, for example, yes, you might get the three points to pass, but then there's no easy point scoring mechanism from there once you take side control. Yeah, I mean, you know, you got to think like, when you're passing half guard, what are you trying to do? Like you're trying to pin their head, you're trying to pin their shoulder. And once you've solved that problem, then you can solve the dilemma of getting your leg out, right? So it's like, yeah. if I don't solve controlling your upper body, I can't really solve getting my leg out on the lower half because everything's in flux, everything's adjusting. So it's like, once you solve the top part, you solve the head and shoulders, you can find your way out. And like, you know, whether you get a cross face and underhook or you get an arm triangle, you're doing the same thing. It's just the beauty of the arm triangle is that like you have one hand free because like the cross face is but done with the arm wrapping the head, but the underhook is done with your head. So then you have a hand free to like try to strip their knees off of your leg. And then, you know, once you pass, you can pass directly to mount and then flare off for the finish, or you can pass off to the side and then come back to the mount. But yep. you get to yep. keep that head and arm control the whole time, which is cool. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing, too, it's funny because people often think of the arm triangle as a, like I said, it's got this perception as being a big guy move. But when it comes to using it for passing, I actually think it's awesome as a little person move. Because the thing about a lot of traditional guard passes, like, and I'm going to keep harping on this example, but, you know, let's say that you're in someone's half guard and you try to cross face them and get that far underhook and pin their shoulders to the mat. One consideration with a lot of those pinning predicaments is they work because you put your body weight on top of your opponent and you hold them there. And against a moderately comparable body type, if your opponent is in the same weight range as you, that's probably totally fine. But what I've found is if you're fighting someone who is significantly larger than you, you know, 60, 70, 80 plus pounds difference, way, way bigger than you, you've got to be really careful putting your body weight on top of them. Because even if it looks like you've got a textbook perfect side control pin their strength may be such that they can still just literally just lift you up so it's always a trade-off when you're fighting up against a massive weight discrepancy about putting your body weight on top of your opponent whereas the beauty of the arm triangle as a pinning position is your body weight is off to the side so if you are fighting someone who is gigantic 
yes, it might be really hard to technically finish the arm triangle against them, but as a pin, it's so powerful because you don't have to put your body weight on top of them. So you don't have to worry about them doing some, you know, Goliath bench press escape to get out of side control or get out of half guard because your body weight is never loaded up on top of them. So that ability to be sort of offside and still hold their body weight down is a super useful detail that I find very helpful against bigger people. Yeah, and I think that you can apply that same kind of idea just to the the way that you hold somebody in side control, you know, because it's like, you think about like when you like sweep somebody, usually like there's a load up phase of the sweep where you find a way to load their weight onto you and then you redistribute it where you want to put them, right? But it's like if you can't get their weight loaded up onto you, you're probably not going to be able to move their weight. And it's like, I tell my students when they're passing the guard, like pay attention to your connection to the floor at all times and like pay attention to like the point where you load yourself up on the other person. Cause a lot of times that's how we get swept is we load ourselves up on the other person and we lose contact with the floor. And then that person rolls or bridges or does whatever and we get thrown. So it's like, okay, like you need to pay attention to being connected to the mat, like beside the other person, not totally on the other person. And then like from the ground, that's where you get your strength because you can drive into them. You can pull back, you can, you know, drop your weight on the mat when you need to. And so like, in that sense, it's like when you're holding side control, it's like you want to focus your pressure on like something like, you know, acute, like their jaw or something like that, turning their head misaligning their spine but you don't want to like have all your weight loaded up on the other person because that's how you get rolled right it's like we need to be connected to the mat and then we can focus our pressure on like a point like a point of their body that immobilizes them and then you know go from there yeah if you try to go for a like a full body pin where you're basically putting your weight on top of the person and you're trying to be like a weighted blanket to hold them down the challenge with that is you're basically giving that person your center of gravity and you're compromising your own base. And if they move now, you are forced to move with them because like you said, you're not drawing your base from the floor anymore. You're drawing your base from sitting on top of your opponent. And if your opponent moves, so must you. So a lot of good pinning is actually not about just laying on top of your opponent like a weighted blanket. It's about being offside to them and using just a small part of your body to surgically drive weight into them and hold them down. So that's why when you're doing a like a traditional side control cross face pin, you don't actually want to be loading your body weight on top of your opponent. You're trying to drive all the weight in through your shoulder. And that's also why the arm triangle works is because you are putting all of your weight and you're driving it into your opponent's own arm as it drives into their throat. If you were to actually load up on top of your opponent and sit on them, now they have some ability to bump and bridge. And if they're strong enough, just literally bench press you and throw you off. So I know that a lot of smaller people steer away from the arm triangle because they think it's, ah, oh, this isn't going to finish any big dudes. And while that may be true, it's still a tremendously powerful pinning situation. So like a lot of submissions, I generally encourage people, don't think of this just as a submission and nothing else. Think of the submission itself as a system or as a position that you can use to hold, control, and advance position when it makes sense. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, while I got you here, something I'd love to talk about, we've kind of done some discussion on arm triangles against big people, but there is a flip side to this argument, which is arm triangles against smaller people. And I actually find that this challenge persists for a lot of head and arm pins, like Kesakatame is the same thing. When you're fighting a big person, yeah, it might be hard to finish them with an arm triangle, but usually their neck and their arms are so big that you can actually hold them there pretty effectively. The problem is if you're fighting a small, squirmy person, it can be real, real hard to actually hold them in an arm triangle just because their neck is going to be smaller, their arm might be smaller or shorter, easier for them to escape the elbow, easier for them to pull their head out. Do you have any considerations or differences that you make when you're doing an arm triangle against a smaller person as opposed to a bigger person? No, it's the same process. It's about taking away space and focusing your pressure to come from either side of their neck. And just you're going to have to close more space against a smaller person with a skinnier neck. But I think that like if you pay attention to like 
the feeling of their shoulder kind of like in the middle of your chest and you just pull your your far elbow into that point and you have that point driving into their shoulder you can take away the space on a very small person but if you just blindly squeeze then you're going to miss it yeah yeah makes sense what about hand grips do you adjust your hand grip because you talked about taking away space and i presume Part of the way that you do that, I presume, is you alter your hand grip depending on how much space you need to take away. I'd just love to know from an arm triangle standpoint, what do you, like, do you gable grip? Do you figure four? What do you do with your hands when you connect them? I go palm to palm and uh, no thumbs, like a gable grip. And that grip usually does the trick. The only adjustment I would make is then kind of choking my arms up further on each other. So, mm-hmm. but... Yeah, palm to palm. That's usually all I need. Yeah, that's that's actually my favorite as well. I have seen people try to do things like figure four or do other weird fancy hand grips, but I find that yeah, I don't, I don't like I don't like the rear naked choke grip. I don't like that grabbing the bicep. I don't do that. Agreed. I find it turns it into a crank, and that quite reliably it turns it into a crank, and it doesn't really get the tap. It just annoys my opponent most of the time. Yeah, because you're elevating the fulcrum behind their neck and then just bending their their head over your forearm, and that can tap yeah. you because it hurts like hell and make your neck pop. But like, it's not like a reliable choke that's going to put people to sleep. I think if you do an arm triangle right, it's like one of the most comfortable chokes to be in. Like if I had to be put out with a choke, I would choose a well done arm triangle. <laughs> <laughs> that that's actually true it's one of the things about i mean the traditional triangle is kind of the same it is a very gentle choke to be put yeah. to sleep with as opposed to something like a guillotine where the person is trying to just reef your head off of your body absolutely <laughs> okay so i mean when we're on the topic of the arm triangle here do you find that it's easier to do in the gi or no gi or do you find it kind of comparable because i know that for some people they find that with the gi it adds a little bit of friction which can be a pro and a con depending on the problems you're having so i'd love to know if you alter depending on uh whether you're in the pajamas or not no i don't change anything it's just you you get more options with the gi because like you think like if you squish the other person's shoulder into their neck, they're going to try to expand inside of your lock to pull their shoulder away from their neck. Like if I kind of hulk out and expand my chest and my elbows and my body, I pull my shoulders away from my neck. And you want me to be all squished up in that little triangle. So when they do that, that's when you can switch to the Ezekiel choke. And you create another triangle around their neck through the Ezekiel. And one of the counters that people will do to get out of the arm triangles they lock their hands under their leg and then they extend their leg thus pulling their shoulder away from their neck and it really opens their neck up so if you transition at that moment to the ezekiel choke super easy and then you're going to get that finish yeah i actually learned this interestingly enough from ryan hall the arm in ezekiel from the arm triangle which is great because the ezekiel is one of my favorite submissions and that is the only time i'd seen someone do an ezekiel with the arm in but you're right that what the person on the bottom being attacked here is going to want to do their predictable response to the arm triangle is going to be they don't want you to ram their bicep into their throat so they're going to try to either answer the telephone, you know, where they try to pull their arm back out so that you can't get that pressure, or they're going to try to do that thing where they wrap their arms around their own leg, like you said, to try to create distance between their arm and their own neck. And if they do that, when you're in the gi, that distance can then be taken up by your own hand. So you can sneak that hand through and just go for the Ezekiel, and it kind of becomes a an even worse situation because unlike a traditional Ezekiel, where your opponent at least has their hands free to fight off the choke, if you Ezekiel from an arm triangle, their hands are tied up, so they really don't have a good defense. No, yeah, that's that's a tough one. It's painful, too. It really is. What about in no gi? Because I, I presume it's really hard to finish that Ezekiel without the gi. Is there anything else that you do in the no gi context when someone tries to answer the telephone or they try to grab their own leg to block the arm triangle? So if they, for those two, like if you try to answer the telephone, I usually just try to choke through that. If you grab under your leg, it's usually going to be coupled with turning away. And so when they turn away, there is, it's like a rear naked choke with their arm in that you can transition to. 
But I wouldn't do that on a bigger person. I would I would only do that on somebody my size or smaller. The other option is just when they turn away, just transition to seatbelt and then just take their back. Yeah. Or if they turn away too far, if they go right up into a perpendicular to try to get away, you can just armbar them, right? Just pop up and take the armbar. Yeah, I usually try to stick with the control from behind. You know, you transition to an arm bar, you have an option to do that, but a lot of things can go wrong. Like uh, you might yeah. lose everything. Whereas like a conservative transition is just, you know, like you turn away, so I take your back. And yeah, you can yeah. do that and, you know, be sure to just increase your control and then work from there. I also transition a lot like from people's back to the arm triangle. Like when people start to escape – and they start to like move their hips in a way where I feel like my hooks are losing purchase. That is a good time to transition to the arm triangle so that by the time they slide out, they're in an arm triangle. That's a really good point too, because a lot of people, when they are in the process of losing back mount, where the mind goes is either they try to hip shovel and switch their hips to retain back mount, or uh-huh. if they know they've lost the position, they might try to just abandon the position and get up to mount. But I like the idea of using that opportunity to secure an arm triangle as well. And I assume you can do that if your opponent is trying to get away and get get their shoulders to the mat, but you're able to keep their arm elevated. I presume there's a window where you could just pop up and go right into that arm triangle position. Yeah, I think it's about just moving in unison with them. Like every movement that they make to escape, you're making an adjustment so that you're transitioning too. Yeah. If you try to jump into the arm triangle before they've gone far enough, then you might lose it. But if like you just kind of stay patient and like just let them keep working, they're going to work their way right into it. Yeah. Absolutely. With the arm triangle, like I mentioned earlier, we talked quite a bit recently with other guests about similar head and arm chokes like the the Dars and the Anaconda. And although these are technically head and arm chokes, they're quite different because when you're going for an Anaconda or a Dars, you have a few options at your disposal that you don't easily have from an arm triangle. Like, for example, it's a lot easier to can opener your opponent's head and break their own posture and drive the back of their head down to tighten the choke. Um, You can also often use your own legs to tie up their legs or their body and get some extra pressure. Whereas with the arm triangle, you basically have to use pinning power and your own body weight and your own body motion to to submit. You can't really coil up your opponent's body or collapse their neck as much because they're they're pinned against the floor. I'd love to know how do you compensate for that? Because I presume that you probably have a similar a similar finding, but with the arm triangle, how do you compensate for the fact that you can't like crunch the person's head in or use your legs against their legs to pull them in like an accordion? Is there any trick that you've got to increase the pressure from there that you might might otherwise get just from laying flat not really i just you know like when i set up my choke i always look away from the person and i like try to get the back of my neck as deep under their shoulder as i can and then i turn my body back in the face them just enough to where my chest makes the angle of being one part of that v that's around their neck right so that's why i get to that angle and i if i look away first and get the back of my neck deep under their shoulder and then like kind of scoop under it and turn back in to face them everything gets pretty tight and like i said it's kind of a comfortable choke like i'm not trying to do some extra move to bend your neck and like hurt it like i'm just trying to squeeze your neck with maximum pressure if i get that cool if not i'll transition to something else but Sure. Like when you do like a guillotine or you do like a Dars choke or something, there's like ways to like pull a fulcrum up under the person's neck and like bend their neck around that fulcrum. And it's like you're kind of leaving the territory of trying to get a clean blood choke. And you're just like, I'm going to break your neck here. You know, you better (laughs) before things go snap, crackle, pop. And like, you know, that's that's fine. I mean, that's effective. You know, I just don't have that same mentality when I'm looking for an arm triangle choke. I'm not really trying to make that happen. Yeah, makes sense. And I like that point you brought up about angling your body, because if you are completely parallel to the person that you're trying to choke when you're doing an arm triangle, you're basically using the side of your neck against their arm, which can be hard. But if you angle your body, then you can use your chest against their arm, which is going to be a lot stronger. Right. So I start out with my neck there, but then as I pull myself in, yeah, it's like the middle of my sternum mashing their shoulder into their own neck. Are you going, like, what kind of angle are we talking? Do you sort of turn just to like a 45 degree angle or do you go even more pronounced than that? Basically, 
if you go too far, then you you make everything fall apart. But if you like think about like your body facing away, then it goes belly down, then it starts to turn in to where now it's facing them a little bit. There's a point where as soon as you like kind of start to face them, that's as far as you need to go. And then you right. just hang out there and like keep the squeeze on them and just keep that pressure increasing. <laughs> well, I think that's an important point too that people have to understand about the strategy of finishing the arm triangle is it does tend to be a bit of a pressure cooker submission. It's not a submission like a guillotine where if you lock that in, the person's going to tap in two seconds. An arm triangle might take a little bit longer, which is why it's important to be patient and also not to burn your arms out and get too excited and put on that power squeeze because it may take some time to get the pressure on your opponent sufficient to get the tap. You're just not squeezing their neck by itself. You've got their head and one of their arms in the same trap. So it will take more power to finish. And as a result, you just want to make sure not to gas your arms out too much. It's better to just sit there and chill. And like you said, kind of like slow roast them (laughs) from the arm triangle. (laughs) I'm presuming you've probably found the same thing where it takes a little bit more time to finish that way versus a a straight neck submission. Yeah, 100 percent. Like I just tell my students is not an arm bar. Like you pull an arm bar until it pops or until they tap. Right. So. Like you're looking for that one acute moment of pain that the person will submit to. This is not what you're trying to do here. Like if you squeeze like and you ramp up your pressure to 100 percent and then you can't hold it and then you have to let it go and then relax that pressure, you know, you're just going up and down here. But like you want your pressure to like ramp up a bit, hold let them cook, wait a few seconds. Then if you feel like they're still breathing and they're still like able to survive, you add a little more, add a little more. The pressure should keep crescendoing up, but like gradually, but you're not trying to like find that like one moment where the person just taps. It's like, you just gotta, like you said, let them cook. It's a crock pot, set it and forget it for a little bit. Let them, (laughs) you know, let them squirm in it. And that's like every blood choke, right? It's like, you get them in there and sometimes it takes a couple seconds because they have to get a little stupid in the joke. So, well, it's a beautiful pressure tactic too. And that's one of the beauties of this move is if you are a pressure player, the arm triangle is a great move because it is a pinning position that ultimately drains the person's energy puts them into a defensive mode because they have to defend the submission and you can break people with that, right? You can break their mindset. You can force them to panic and make mistakes. So if you're a pressure player, the arm triangle is awesome for that capacity because even if you don't get the finish, it's going to dwindle down their energy bar a little bit and start to get them into that mindset where they make dumb mistakes. Sure. I like it when you put it on them and they don't realize they're actually choking because they can technically like still breathe. And then they like, They think they're okay, and then they realize, like, oh, no, I'm actually about to go out. They feel, like, everything closing, and then you feel that, like, sudden, like, urgency to get out. And you're like, oh, yeah, you know, it's like they (laughs) they think they're okay. That's I think that's why people go out a lot for that joke because it's like a lot of times you still can breathe because through the middle of your neck, it's not blocked. But on the sides, you're getting that squeeze, which is cutting the blood off. So it's like when you can still breathe in a choke, you think you're okay, but then – you feel the lights dimming and then you got to get out. Yeah. I have definitely had that experience where I thought I was okay. I thought I was okay. And then I wasn't. (laughs) And I've had the same situation with a lot of head and arm chokes, uh, including the traditional triangle choke. And like you said, you tend to not to have that experience with a straight neck choke because If you're putting someone in a guillotine or a rear naked or a bow and arrow, you're going to have pressure on the windpipe as well as on the carotid. So people have that feeling of, I, you know, their oxygen has been cut off. Whereas with a head and arm choke, it is possible to apply pressure to the carotids only. So a person might sit there and be just, you know, hanging out and they feel like they feel okay because they can breathe. And then suddenly they realize I am really lightheaded right now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have had that happen to me where I was fighting and I thought I was totally okay. And then all of a sudden I realized I am about to pass out from this position. Yeah. I love it when you can get like the Von Flew effect, like when you have someone <laughs> with eye control and you can use your shoulder to choke them and then they like, When they realize like, oh, I'm getting choked here from the side control pressure, then they they spaz out a bit. That's a good, yeah. it's a fun, fun, fun thing to do. 
And incidentally, if they spaz out a bit, that usually creates openings that make it easier for the person to try to finish the choke. Sure. Because if they're doing one of those traditional arm triangle defenses, like trying to grab their own leg or answering the telephone, as soon as they start to feel a bit lightheaded, if they were using that technique, they're going to abandon it and try real hard to get out of there. So you can kind of force that degree of panic and just being patient is often a good strategy when people start employing those defenses. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'm actually not really a fan of those types of defenses where you, you know, you're stuck in an arm triangle and then your defense is to basically grab your leg and just sit there and and wait and hope your opponent releases the submission because you're not doing anything to get out of it. If you grab your leg or if you try to answer the telephone, I mean, you might be relieving the pressure temporarily, but you're not making any motion or effort to escape the submission. So your opponent can just sit there and continuously attack you or bare minimum just hold you in this terrible pinning predicament for as long as they want. So uh, one of the things that I, I do like about the arm triangle is a lot of those predictable defenses that people use, they're not really defending with any purpose, with any meaningful attempt to get out. I mean, a good submission defense is not just about stalling in the submission and hoping your opponent's going to let go. It's about actively trying to escape the submission. So if your opponent is doing that thing where they're grabbing their leg, I mean, it's not really the end of the world because probably the best they're going to get is maybe temporarily relieving the pressure. They're not really likely to escape the submission doing that. No, but it's like, you know, if you, I mean, the first thing is survive, right? So like always die later, even if you think it's, you know, what you're doing is going to definitely lead to you getting submitted. Like if getting submitted is further down the line, then always push it because the other person might mess up or they might not have a good transition out. And I remember one time I got caught in an arm triangle in a match and, you know, the guy had a good arm triangle, but I was just like, all right, well, I guess I got to grab my leg and try to open my shoulder up. And then when I did that, this was in the gi. So I assumed he was going to switch to the Ezekiel because that's what I would do. But then he didn't and he let go and he went to take my back. And in his attempt to take my back, I was able to escape that moment. And, you know, like, you know, you always want to, you know, push back the the ending, you know, and like, sure, you want to escape, but sometimes the best you can do is just, you know, not die. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you do what you got to do, right? Yeah, most definitely. Now, hey, I got a question for you, and we might be veering into like meme choke territory here, but... Okay. Generally speaking, when you think of the arm triangle, you think of it as a top side pinning predicament, uh-huh. but it is technically possible to do it from the bottom. Uh-huh. Primarily where I'm thinking about is closed guard. If sure. you can get your opponent's arm passed across their center, it is possible to latch on the arm triangle and finish from there. But it's it's not something I have ever seen done at a high level. Yeah, that was my white that was my white belt game plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was what I was going to say. I used to do this when I was a white belt, but I just I stopped as I got more experienced, not because there was anything necessarily wrong with it, but just because I kind of thought, okay, this is probably a meme submission here. But I would ask you, do you think there's any merit to that? Any value in trying to attack that kind of submission from the bottom like from closed guard, for example, or is that just a no-no? I, it's not a no-no, and I don't care about the meanness of it, but I just think that like it's much harder to finish it from the bottom because the other person is not pinned, right? So yeah, you know when you're on top, you have a lot more control. But if you use, you know, like there's a lot of like sweeps engaging like butterfly hooks where you get a head and arm control on the person, and then you can use the hooks to sweep them or the shoulder clamp sweeps, you know, I think that it's kind of the same thing. Like you can use the arm triangle to sweep because if I have closed guard and I get an arm triangle on you, I can grapevine your legs. So if I can grapevine your legs, I can probably find butterfly hooks. If I can get butterfly hooks, I can knock out the post to the side of the arm that's trapped in the arm triangle and then roll you to that side because you don't have an arm or a knee. So if I were to get it from the bottom, I would either be trying to like crawl to the person's back or I would be trying to use my butterfly hooks to sweep the person. And then once I'm in a better position, that's where I'll try to finish it. Versus when I was a white belt, I would just grab that thing and squeeze as hard as I could <laughs> and hope for the best. And sometimes I would get a tap, but most times no. Yeah, that's a really good point too there, which is that if you get the arm triangle from the bottom, it's 
it's hard to finish. I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's hard. But what you can do, because you've crossed their arm past the center line and you've blocked their ability to post, it makes it really easy to do things like butterfly sweeps. And like you said, if you can grape find that leg and block that other post on that side, you've now completely blocked the posts on one side of their body. So there are reasons to set up the arm triangle from closed guard, because if you can then turn that into a butterfly sweep, you're going to come up on top right into an arm triangle, which is an awesome way to come up because not only do you get the sweep, but you're right in a submission and failing the ability to get the submission, you can pop right up to neon belly and collect an extra two points just for doing that. So it is viable from there. And where I often attempt that sometimes I'm able when I'm on bottom and close guard, I might be able to get my opponent's arm across their body. And maybe I'm thinking to myself, okay, I want to try to climb their back, but I'm thinking, you know what? It's just a distance too far. I don't think I could get all the way to their back without them turning around and and resetting into guard. So instead, I just latch onto that head and arm grip. And from there, like you said, you can use that as a sweeping vehicle. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And you know, like you might be able to kick their post out and just go right to their back. Sometimes I'll get close to their back. And then if it's in the gi, you can transition to a head and arm Ezekiel from there. Yes. You know, definitely a good control takes away the other person, all the other person's offense. Well, I think the thing that we're kind of touching on here is that the arm triangle, like a lot of submissions, is kind of best viewed in the context of a whole system. And I think probably a good comparison is the Kimura. You know, I I remember it when the Kimura was kind of looked at as a big guy only move and little people just didn't do it because they couldn't generate the power to finish it. But we've since developed a more nuanced understanding of that submission. And we look at it not just as a sub but as a whole submission and position system where you can play the Kimura trap game and you can use it for positional advancement. And ultimately, if you're able to get to the person's back, for instance, you're probably going to be able to start finishing or holding whatever submission you want, regardless of the size discrepancy. And I think the arm triangle has a similar merit where if you look at it just as a straight up submission, then it's easy to argue that there's limitations around it, around body type, for example, or around strength requirements. But if you look at it as part of a system where, yeah, you can actually get this from closed guard and use it to sweep, or you can get this from top side guard and use it to pass. You now have a, a much more nuanced view of this move. And I think at that point, it starts to become a lot more viable, even if you're not the strongest person in the world. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I don't think that like, you know, you have to be super strong to do any arm triangle or head and arm chokes. I think that that's, you know, that's a misnomer. Yeah, I think that only really applies if your game is based entirely on finishing by squeezing, (laughs) in which case, sure, you know, having big biceps is going to help. But it's if you look at the arm triangle through a wider lens, there's a lot of other mechanics that you can compensate for that. I mean, yes, it will always be hard if you're just fighting someone who is way bigger than you. I think there is a point where, okay, if you're giving up like 80, 90, 100 pounds, maybe this isn't going to get the tap, but you can still use it as a very powerful control topside pin and it's still a great strategy for the reasons we brought up earlier sure sure and plus if you're going against someone that big it's like everything's hard right <laughs> yeah that that is true i mean you can tailor your game plan as much as you want but if skill is, and experience are equivalent then size starts to become a massive outsized advantage On the topics here of arm triangles, I mean, it sounds like you guys have a pretty well-developed system for doing this stuff. And like I brought up earlier, a lot of these details, you know, you talked about how you were competing with someone and you expected them to go for the arm triangle Ezekiel and they just didn't. I'm not totally surprised because a lot of people outside of Ryan Hall's lineage, I don't really see that move a lot. The only people I've seen it from are Ryan Hall and people who studied with or under him. So I'm wondering, it sounds like you guys have a pretty developed system for this stuff. Are there any resources that you or your team have put together that you recommend? Alternately, maybe you didn't put them together, but someone else did that you would recommend as a good study resource for people who want to develop a, a comprehensive arm triangle game? Yeah, Ryan Hall has some instructionals on arm triangles. I've got a couple of YouTube videos on them. Ryan has a great course. Like if you go to 
think it might be ryanhall.com. I'll have to check on what the actual link is. But he's got some instructionals that he's done uh, in the last couple of years on arm triangles and taking the back and creating a whole system around like uh, reverse triangles to guillotines to back control. It's really good stuff. So I highly recommend those. Got it. Got it. And I'll put the links in the show notes just so that people can figure out where to go if they want to check the stuff out. But that's probably as good a transition as any here. So we covered a lot on the topic of arm triangles. Any closing thoughts or ideas, details you wanted to bring up or share that we didn't talk about yet during this convo? No, not that come to mind right off off top. I think we covered a lot about arm triangles. Yeah, pretty good chat. Well, with that said, I mean, let's talk about you then, Seth. If people want to get in touch with you, if they want to check out your work, where do they go to do that? So I have, you know, some different videos online, but I have a website. It's upstreambjjonline.com. And I have some instructionals that I've made myself on there. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can just email me at sethsmithbjj at gmail.com or uh, just message me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Seth will kill you. And uh, <laughs> you can find that or just, you know, social media or look me up on Google and email the gym. <laughs> awesome. And as always, I'll put all of the links in the show notes. So if anything caught your interest here that we talked about, you should just be able to pop those open and just click right through. Awesome. Well, Seth, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. And of course, to everyone out there who listens, big thanks to you as well. And especially those who support us on premium. For those who don't know, and we do talk about this in pretty much every episode, so I'm sure you've heard about it before. Premium is the primary service that we offer. It's really how you take the ideas that we talk about on the show and take them to the next level. We've got a lot of awesome structured courseware and audio series on there there's a free trial so there's really no risk to giving it a shot if you like the show here highly recommend you give premium a shot and like i said no risk to you there's a free trial so please do check it out premium.bjjmentalmodels.com all right seth well thanks again so much for coming by i greatly appreciate it and i am looking forward to go and practice squeezing some people's heads all right my pleasure thanks (laughs) for having me No worries. And thanks to all of the listeners, of course, for spending the time here with us every week. Always greatly appreciated. Talk to you next time.